and welcome to the Writer's Journey. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is Kayleen Cool as Ice Tea Williams and our friend Ken, the Word Wizard Brits. We're three authors on a journey to learn more with you, the audience, and thank you for joining us. Today, we're talking about Draft to Digital, a tool that enables authors to easily publish their books on all the major publishing platforms out there. According to Draft Digital's Stellar blog, our guest has long been a part of the bookselling e industry throughout its evolution from brick and mortar operations into online and digital venues. He has been at the forefront of online bookselling, bringing print on demand into physical retail spaces and helping to usher in the ebook and indie publishing boom. He is best known in the indie publishing world as the founding director of Cobo Writing Life and is an active member of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. He is now Director of Business Development at Draft Digital. Mark Leslie Lefebvre, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me here. It's an honor. <laughs> Whew, I knew that. Hey, now we're done. It. <laughs> um, so how are you guys doing? Um, Mark, what's it like in Canada right now? Uh, rainy, right where I am in Waterloo. So I'm near Toronto, mm -hmm. Ontario. Um, obviously, with COVID-19 going on, our province declared a state of emergency relatively early on. So a lot of us are in sort of self-isolation, lockdown, essential services, pretty much the same as in, in most centers. My work, because I work from home mostly, the only thing that's changed for me is uh, a whole bunch of canceled trips to go speak at conferences. <laughs> so oh, a no. lot more virtual <laughs> stuff. <laughs> like tonight, you're yeah. Here and thank you for doing that. Um, Ken, how have things been going with you? Uh, going pretty good. Um, I think I'm in the same place, but in uh -huh. Long Island, so kind of near the hotbed. Um, but again, I, I'm similar to Mark. I work from home and all of my travel has essentially gone away and uh, uh -huh. spend all my days watching my kids and working and trying to squeeze in an hour of writing a day. <laughs> Write those, write those words. Yeah, <laughs> don't stop. <laughs> and Haley, how have you been doing? I like your shirt, by the way. I know, oh, nice. right? Yes. Uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not matching. <laughs> totally did not plan it at all. Seriously. Um, no, I'm surviving. Yeah. I, I wake up and I survive. <laughs> that's, that's what we're doing. Yep. And take each day at a time. You're loving on the people that you're with, on your mom, on your daughter. Mm -hmm. You're squeezing in those words. You got your draft finished. We were just talking about this the other day. You're working on uh, your draft to the next book you're writing. And you just got that done, and now you're in the oh, editing. Yeah, I did. I finally wrote the end on a full manuscript. This beast is almost 100,000 words. Um, and, and we just got a macaw. <laughs> she's gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she's a sweetheart, so... That's now, me. Mark, I've heard you on other podcasts for the past couple of years. You've been in the indie publishing space since it was started and you've helped it to become what it is today. Um, how did you get into indie publishing? 2004, uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, traditionally published with small um, small press magazines, short stories. The, the, the going wisdom was write and publish short stories and get them published and get to bigger and bigger magazines. And then maybe one day you'll be lucky enough to get the attention of an agent or an editor. And uh, I'd been a bookseller since 92. So I was in the industry and people would say, you're, a, you're a, um, a writer. Yes, I am. Well, where can I find your stuff? And I said, well, if you get in a car and you drive for six hours and you cross the Canadian border and go into the US, into Michigan, and maybe if you get there before, oh, it's April 30th. You got to get there before May 1st because the, the issue of the magazine that's Circulation 500 is going to come off the shelves the last day of April. Mm -hmm. uh, rats, I guess you missed it. So mm -hmm. I got I got frustrated with that. And I mm -hmm. learned about uh, Ingram. This is way before uh, Spark was the thing. They had Lightning Source, which is sort of a, a harder to use. I always thought of Ingram Spark as the Fisher Price version of mm -hmm. the on demand because it's prettier and easier to use and the buttons are bigger. <laughs> so, uh, whereas uh, lightning source is what uh, publishers use. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> and so 2004, I, I had a lot of friends who, who were writers and I, I'd said, well, I've got all these stories. I want to, I want to put together a collection and self publish it. And, and, and my friends all said, no, that's the best way to ruin your careers. If you do this vanity publishing thing. And I looked at it and, and I, I created an imprint, Stark imprint. So 
my best friend Steve uh, and myself, we had a, a DJ company in university and we called it Stark. He got the first two letters, I got the last three. He was a graphic designer, so he made me a logo so I could hide behind it and not <laughs> let people know it was self-published. And, and I took these stories, 90% of them were, were already published before, so I kind of felt justified that some editor had already edited it, picked it from a slush pile. So I had that stamp of approval, so I went and did that. And that's kind of how I got started in publishing. Since then, I have traditionally published. About half my books are traditionally published. The other half are self-published or indie published. So, um, yeah, about 10 years before all the cool kids were doing it, I was, uh, I was hiding uh, mm. and pretending I wasn't self-publishing. Now you can kind of say it with a, you know, with pride and conviction, but back then you would, it'd be like admitting picking your nose, right? Like that, <laughs> that's the, that's the, it was a scratch, it. not a pick. <laughs> What's that? It was a scratch, not a pick. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just trying to say. <laughs> yeah, so you like see it. how the indie publishing has changed really the publishing world. And right now it looks like we're kind of in the middle of another kind of transformation mm. brought to us, you know, by outside forces. And we'll be talking about that later in the show where you see the publishing world going right now uh, during the pandemic and especially where you see draft to digital kind of how they're responding and what they might be doing in the future. Um, but first, uh, could you explain what draft digital is for those of us who are totally new? We have no idea what we're, we're asking about what services you guys offer. Yeah, so in a nutshell, draft to digital and it's draft the number two, digital.com, is uh, a place where you can go and have a, a Word document converted to an EPUB for free. And uh, with some great templates, about 16 different templates to actually, you know, with drop cap and, and, and a pretty design and stuff like that. And the cool thing about it is it's 100% free. You can go make EPUBs there and take them away. Or while you're there, if you want, you can choose to distribute those to different retailers and library markets. We've got about uh, 16 or 17 different retail and library markets that you can send stuff to. And the nice thing about it is you can choose, you can decide to. So for example, I publish directly to uh, Amazon through uh, Kindle Direct Publishing. I created Kobo Writing Life, so I'm still a little bit partial to this Canadian uh, <laughs> direct publishing to Kobo. So I typically go direct to Kindle and direct to Kobo, but then I use Draft to Digital for all the other places. But you can select how you want to do that. So all the tools are free, and uh, and that's that's the basic thing. Now there's other additional tools that D 2 D has, such as Books to Read, which is books the number two read dot com. It very similar. Uh, parallels you'll notice in the naming of our of our uh, different platforms and offers, and and that is something I use as a traditionally published author as well because you don't even need to be publishing to D to D to use it. With every book you publish through D to D, uh, you get a, a universal book link. So the whole idea is it's a single book link that shows your book on Kindle, on Apple, on Kobo, on Nook, on all of the places that it's available. And uh, so what I've done is uh, all the books that I've self-published, I have a universal book link for, and you can custom name them, uh, vanity name them. So for example, books2read.com slash evasion is one of my thrillers, and that's a self-published thriller, and you can go, and when you go there, you'll see it's available on all the different stores, and there's also the links to the audiobook there. But my traditionally published books, where I have licensed the rights or sold the rights to a publisher, I don't publish them, but I also have books2read.com slash haunted hospitals, which is one of my traditionally published books. And so when you go to my author page, that's a free thing from draft to digital, it's kind of like having an author central page, but it's for every store. Oh. Yeah, and that's that's those are some of the free things that draft digital offers. And so if you publish through draft to digital, the difference is if you go direct, you're getting your 70% or 35%. If you're going through draft to digital, you're only going to make 60% because draft to digital basically keeps 10%. That's that's kind of how they make they make money. So it's just kind of a, a tool out there to support writers and hopefully writers make money. And if they make money, then draft to digital gets to gets to come back and fight another day. And honestly, 10% uh, is like pennies to be able to reach all these places that I mean, when I was on there, I'm like, I didn't know that was a thing. Check that <laughs> out. Yeah. You know, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, it can save you time too, instead of logging in. And one of the other benefits which you don't get from, uh, for example, Kindle Direct Publishing or Kobo Writing Life is you can have a virtual assistant, you can assign a virtual assistant an account number to have access to go and add titles for you and edit them 
but not have access to your banking information and not be able to see sales reports. So Ooh. that's that's a benefit, right? Of of especially when writers, you know, you're you'd be better off writing while someone else does some of the other maintenance for you. And that's another really great option that exists there. Right. Yeah. It sounds like you, your platform makes a lot of things easy. We can look up how to get our books onto each of these different platforms and figure that all out. Yeah. We can look look up how to get our books into libraries and figure that all out. Or we can just have a company do it for us. That's the idea. The whole <laughs> idea is if we can make it easier for writers to do certain things, converting the books for free, having universal book links so they don't have to have like eight links for Amazon and eight or 25 links for Kobo and Apple and all the different geo territories. You know, you're gonna have a hundred different links for all for just the, the four major uh, stores. And um, if we can save authors time, maybe they can write more books. And if they write more books, everyone wins. All right, uh, Rick Partlow, who just got number one on Amazon. Congratulations, Rick. He says it takes a lot of effort to publish to all the various markets yourself. Yeah. Um, I had a few books wide until recently, and I made the effort to do it myself everywhere I could. But I did draft to digital for Apple and Barnes and Noble. Cool. Yeah, and that, that's the whole idea. I, I like that Rick's doing that, right? He recognizes where he's going to save himself some time. Mm -hmm. Thomas Hoddle, he agrees and says he's had bigger draft to digital checks than Amazon. Well, that's cool. I'd love to hear more from that. If you can reach out to me, uh, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, it is mark.lefave at drafttodigital.com. Or if you can't figure out how to spell that last name, just email us or support at drafttodigital.com and they'll punt it over to me. Screenshot it because he has it spelled correctly right now. <laughs> I think I spelled it correctly. <laughs> I make no promises. <laughs> Send to Mark. <laughs> All right. Well, here's, here's our hard question. Um, uh oh. Authors might be thinking, oh boy, it's so hard to make money already on my books. Uh, this is tough. Even giving up that 10% of my royalties will be hard. Um, what do you say to that author who's trying to kind of weigh the, the return on investment, you know, cost reward and say, here's something else you need to think about? Yeah, you know what? There's uh, there's no one answer. Uh, what, what I love about Draft Digital, why I was so happy to join the team, is that our attitude is we're going to build some tools, and you can use them and leverage them the way you want to use them or not. You can decide to use us to publish. You can just use us for some of the free things that we've built for you. We're we're fine with whatever you do because we know that every author, every book itself, has its own unique path for success. Some books may be better suited to be exclusive to Amazon. That's fine. Mm -hmm. If that's working for you, awesome. We're happy that authors can make a living from this. So it's really, there is no one answer to anything. There's no one answer for every book. And so you may make that decision that's best for you at this time. And that could change over time. And and, and we're kind of there to support you no matter what you want to do. And, and what I love about it is I've never been, even as an author, never been a pushy, salesy kind of guy. I just want to say, well, here's what I have. And if it's not your cup of tea, well, so-and-so has some really cool stuff over there. You should go check it out. And draft to digital has this, the same uh, mentality. It's like, hey, we're going to be here. We're going to offer you guys some stuff. Sometimes you'll find uh, that it is worthwhile. The, the time and energy that you're spending might be worth it for the 10% margin. Other times you, that you might not feel that that's a, a value. And, and however you feel is valid to you. So we kind of just roll with that and, and, and respect, uh, respect that. And, and we're not really going <laughs> to fight or argue with the exception of saying that, um, you know, as uh, uh, Kevin and I, for example, at Draft Digital are authors ourselves, and we understand how hard it can be from an author's yeah. perspective. So one of the things we're often doing is we get to beta test things from our perspective, saying, well, how would I use this as an author? And then reach out. Uh, to all the authors that we're in contact with and then bring them into the beta program. I mean, it's why print was delayed nine months because we needed to make sure the beta users we had in there were very, very happy before we moved on. Uh, and again, if it weren't for all of the great feedback we got from the author community, it wouldn't be the really cool tool that, tool that it is. And I know that's gonna, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, so I don't wanna jump ahead. And I think that's the, isn't that's, where um, the decision for the author is the is the time versus money, right? If, yeah. Is your is your time more valuable writing or mm -hmm. or spending time with I don't know 20, 25 books 
book fronts to right. push your book, push your book to. Right. Or or, and, and you can't get to some of them directly. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you can, you, you do what I did and you pull your hair out. Um, <laughs> so that, that's one of the options, right? It's, it's your, your, your blood pressure is really important. Mm -hmm. too. Right. So one of the, one of the things that I know, um, a lot of newer authors kind of, they jump the gun on a lot of things. So they put something up, they wait three days and they're like, it's not working. And then they run. Yeah. Um, what do you kind of see on average for, you know, it's a fresh new book. It's just got accepted to whatever the right. platforms that, um, cause, and of course there's different things an author can do to help that as well. As far as seeing an average turnaround before an author could start being like, well, Maybe I need to change something up. Either, all the options. You're not going to like my answer because I, I know this is yeah, like the yeah, toughest question ever because it's like it depends. It's, <laughs> yeah, but it's um, on average, on average, six to nine months minimum, which is unlike traditional publishing, where it's in traditional publishing, it's all about the first ninety to days to the first six months. In, in digital publishing, it's not necessarily that. And I know there's the Amazon thirty day cliff and all that stuff, but every retailer is a different platform. I know it does take a lot of time and a lot of traction. Now, I'm fortunate in that I, uh, you know, back in the day, Junior, when we had to walk to school uphill both ways in 10 feet of snow, but back in the day, I would send a manuscript out to a publisher in a, at the, at the post office and you would mail things. Mm -hmm. And I would wait six to nine months for a rejection to come in so I could have the honor of sending it to another publisher to be rejected. And now I compare that to, Every day I wake up and I log on to my dashboard and I click refresh to see if I had any sales. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a different environment. And I, and I wonder, I mean, I used to uh, wait eagerly for the mailman and the uh, hope that an acceptance would come in. And of course I've transmitted that into the, Ooh, I have a pro now if I have an active promo going on, I am actively looking to see, did the book bub, did the bargain books, he did that actually push my sales up um, or mm -hmm. any other kind of promos that I'm doing. But for the most part, I try to remind myself the sales, I put things into place, I'm buying ads or I'm doing whatever, I put things in motion, sitting there and watching the, the, the pot boil is yeah. not the best use of my time. Um, and, and, and I think uh, I used to say, uh, I have the seven P's of publishing success was a book that I recently released. And it was based on I used to always say patience, practice, and persistence were the, you know, the holy trinity of of, of what a writer needs to be uh, successful. You need mm -hmm. you need to write a lot. You need to keep writing, and you need to wait. <laughs> you need to have a lot of patience. Yeah. And, and I think that's the case. Trying to look at something and say, well, I put my book up and it's out for a week, and uh, I haven't sold any. It's a complete flop. Well. Mm -hmm. Wool from Hugh mm -hmm. Howie, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it did quite well. Dude's got a boat and he's traveling around just living off of his uh, royalties now. And Ridley Scott option that. That was his 10th book. Mm -hmm. and, and in traditional publishing, it wasn't always until the third, fourth, or fifth book in, with an author that the, that the publisher knew it would, it would not be till then that you took off. And I remember when uh, Bella Andre and Barbara Freedy, who had been traditionally published and we're moving in. They were early pioneers in the indie author space. So I remember talking to them and the same thing was true. It wasn't until book three or book four that things really started to pick up once they built the catalog. So I think patience is a critical factor and it's, and it's hard because it's our baby and we've worked so hard and we've published it. Um, but the best thing you can do to sell the book you have out now is to work on the next one rather than focusing on because <laughs> the, the dashboard can be disappointing it, some days. Yeah, you, the dashboard can be just as distracting as social media. <laughs> yeah, it can be worse than in going and getting into a uh, like a fight on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh, pretty easy to do. <laughs> well, speaking of the dashboard, Scott Mean had a question. He asked, "Can we see our sales report?" Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, you, the sales reports. Um, so the draft digital, there's a high level view that just shows you this month, right? So today is the last day of April when we're doing this. So it's going to show you the full 30 days. Uh, the next uh, day, it'll roll over to May 1st. And people always panic, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, I have nothing. <laughs> it's like, yes, they had sales. like, no, it's because May 1st, you're, you're only one hour into May. Stop looking at your dashboard. Go back to sleep. Um, but uh what you can do is the, 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 I think one of the problems with our reporting is it's so powerful. You can go and create custom reports and it is quite phenomenal. I've actually, 
spent quite a quite a few hours looking at it because we're going to be working on revising them to to, to build some more built-in templates so you can just point and click. But it's so flexible. You can go in and 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 you can slice and dice. I think it's too powerful, and and it's almost mm -hmm. like this choice. Anyone who's a parent may know that if you give your child the choice to look at the entire closet and what they're going to dress in, they have this anxiety where there's like um, um, too much choice. And it's mm -hmm. uh, analysis paralysis where there's just too much. They don't know what to do. But if you say, okay, you can choose between these two shirts, and these two pairs of pants. Well, at least you've narrowed it down for them. Um, so you can do that. And then the other thing that's really, really great is those historic sales you can export uh, into Excel. You can look at them online. You can export them into Excel. And so your, your sales reports from previous months and your payments are all quite visible. Uh, Kevin Tumlinson had created some amazing videos on our draft to digital uh, YouTube page and uh, walked through so much of the uh, of these great things. And I'm a visual learner, so I, I actually need to look at those and refresh, <laughs> remind myself how to do these things. That'd be good for figuring out uh, taxes. <laughs> yes. Just need taxes, but there's a lot of data you got to keep track of. It. And if you're not an organized person, if something else is doing it for you, then that's that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, because you can separate out the international and, and U.S. sales, right? And yeah. because the you get the thirty percent that I believe it is right automatic for international, and then U.S. you don't pay taxes. We have to go and that's yeah. what we want to pull out of the information on sales so that we can report that as income, right? Right. <laughs> and I have the opposite, right? I, as a Canadian, I have to uh, I have to declare that Canadian I'm part of the treaty country, so I don't get thirty percent withholding tax for all my stuff from Draft <laughs> Digital and Amazon or any other American uh, organization. Wow! All these things we need yeah. to think. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to ask uh, for. A, a new author, what is your best advice for, um, I guess it's also dependent on genre, but let's assume right. that genre doesn't matter um, because it absolutely does depending on the storefront, right? Yeah. Um, what is your best advice for an, a new author that wants to be a wide, you know, good, get as where yeah. as many places as possible? I think it's important to, to look at uh, and and, and um, uh, check out the systems yourself. Go in, check it out. Check out, there's so many free resources. There's so many great author groups and communities where uh, people are so willing and generous to talk to you and share their own experiences. I mean, take everything with a grain of salt. Take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, be, a, be a little bit skeptical of everything you hear um, and, and, and recognize uh, the other thing that's true about the self-publishing space that has been true about traditional publishing. I'm fortunate that I've had experience on both sides that I can kind of see these parallels is that um, the majority of people out there are not flying in Learjets and private jets and all of the things and not killing it and, and making six and seven and eight figures. We hear about those because those are the exciting stories. Those are the James Pattersons. Those are the Stephen Kings. Those are the J.K. Rowlings, right? Those are the ones, those are the breakaways. What we don't hear are the 100,000 other authors who are traditionally published that are you know, mid-list authors or just selling a few books here and there. Mm -hmm. We don't hear about that in the indie author space. Mm -hmm. So a lot of authors come into the space see that so-and-so is making so much money and they're doing really, really well and the book got option for film and all of these things happen. And they go, gee, I only sold a book, one book this month. And they feel horrible about themselves, not realizing that they're more like most of the other authors than the superstars that they're focusing on. Mm -hmm. So that comparisonitis can be a real devastating thing for an author. The other thing is, Think always about your target audience. I know you want to have big sales and stuff like that, but always think about the reader and what is the problem that your book solves for a reader and always focus on as niche as possible. Mm -hmm. I always say define yourself as a big fish in a small pool is the mm -hmm. best way to do it. So uh, I'll give you a perfect uh, personal example. I uh, wrote the book Spooky Sudbury, which is uh, true ghost stories of a city in Northern Ontario 90,000 people. So, you know, for American standards, that's like a village, right? It's a small, it's not even a city. To me, it's the big city because I grew up in a town of 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now, in that town of 2,000 people, I can define myself as the best-selling horror author from that town. 
because I'm the only one. I don't have to check. You could just I mean, say best-selling great. author. You, you can stop at the horror part. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I did a book signing at a Costco. Uh, the Steve, Stephen King's Doctor Sleep was on a skid. Spooky oh. Sudbury was on a skid beside it, and I spent the day in the store selling copies of Spooky Sudbury. I can say I outsold Stephen King in one uh. in one Costco in <laughs> one city in, in one afternoon. He never noticed. Uh, I only because I was there all day and he wasn't had he been there I wouldn't have sold a single book probably but uh, again focusing on defining yourself in in a smaller microcosm if I compare myself to Stephen King and other like great horror writers I'm always going to feel bad about myself but if I think about where I was yesterday and yesterday I hadn't even finished the novel but I now have finished a novel well last month I hadn't even had a book published now I have a book published right I think it's okay to, to pat yourself on the back for those small victories instead of beating yourself up because we, we as creative people tend to beat ourselves up too much. And I think to a beginning writer, you know, think about every little step you're taking forward uh, on that journey is that much closer to success, even if it's not the success that you're seeing and reading about and dreaming about. So that's, those are some of the things. And then take, take your time. Um, if you're looking at, uh, you may not be able to conquer it all at once. You may have to focus on one retailer. Well, Amazon is the world's biggest bookstore. A lot of authors, it's easier to say, well, let's go with, and especially if you're American, like that, it's huge in America, maybe not in, in other uh, countries around the world, but it's huge there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, let's be honest, uh, America has a big population. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of readers. So why not start with something like that, learn the ropes, and then move on. So, so uh, as far so. as... Um, all those different platforms, the Kobo, the Amazon, the B&B, &B, the iTunes, what would be like your top five, I guess, for, for that newer author or even a seasoned author who's been, you know, exclusive for yeah. all this time? What would be like the top five, try these out and then start expanding into all the other? So, yeah, um, the, the top five platforms to use or the top five the top five platforms that D2D offers, uh, minus Amazon and minus Kobo, because those seem to be two of like the easiest sure. ones to go direct with. Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, Apple, um, and Apple's been doing some amazing stuff, uh, really doing some great merchandising. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about Apple and uh, and Nook and, and Kobo in a, in a little. Uh, they're kind of similar in that they do have algorithms but they're very heavily merchandiser based, human merchandise based. Whereas on Amazon, the inmates run the asylum basically. And, and a lot of authors who are doing Amazon, they're chasing algorithms. And the minute, it, it's like you ever see a, a group of 10 year old kids playing soccer? You get one kid has the ball and then the whole group of kids, no one plays position. They just kind of go across the field and follow that one kid with the ball. The only one who's happy is the one kid with the ball. Everyone else is chasing after it. And it keeps changing because then some other kid gets the ball and it goes in the other direction. That's Amazon. That's that's how I see. You're always chasing that next thing because they change it at a moment's notice. Whereas at the other platforms like Kobo and Apple and Nook, there's a lot more human curation just like a traditional bookstore. And so some of the tactics and, and things that you would do to, 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 to game the system on Amazon uh, and, and I don't say that in a derogatory manner. I'm just saying that's that's what we're doing. We're playing the system for 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 the way we can because we have to do those things. Um, you, it's different on those platforms. It takes time. It, it's getting the attention of of the merchandisers. Sometimes it's running a promotion, and then when you get that promotion, then you get their attention. Um, it's it's networking with them. It's connecting with them. It's remembering there's a human on the other side. It's not just an algorithm. There's actually people at Apple and at Barnes and Noble and at Kobo. Yeah, um, they, they all have those sort of uh, editors picks sort of thing, right? I think Kobo yeah. has that too, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> uh, make sure if you're trying to publish wide and you're trying to grow on the other platforms, include a link to the other retailers. And I do know, personally know that the folks at Kobo and the folks at Apple are completely fine with a books to read link, a universal book link, because it's inclusive. But, uh, you know, when I worked at Kobo, I remember, you know, an author would, would, would usually come screaming at me or in all caps emails or you know, conversation, well, what Kobo's doing, nothing for me and Amazon's great and you suck. And then I would look at the signature of their email and the signature would have, go buy my books. And there's a link of their, um, you know, author central uh, profile mm -hmm. or a link only to Amazon and only to Amazon in the U.S. Um, so 
I would look at that and say, remember every little thing you do, uh, every interaction you have speaks huge volumes to those people who are paying attention and listening, which is why one of the P's is professionalism. All right, so definitely Apple, the uh, B and yeah. N, because apparently I said B and B before. Yeah. Um, Kobo, Apple, Amazon, definitely some some good ones to get your teeth sunk into, get your feet wet. Yeah, um, and libraries. I didn't even get there. Uh, the library systems like OverDrive. I have, I have a question. So, does Draft Digital just get the book up on those platforms, or does it also help get the book in front of readers on those platforms? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, uh, Dan Wood and I have been working at this uh, really hard over the last little while. Where we actually uh, yesterday we met with a representative from Kobo, and the day before met with somebody from uh, Apple, and we're constantly trying to pitch new titles that are coming from D to D to those platforms. The same way that a publisher. Well, publishers used to pitch me when I was managing and buying books for a bookstore. They would say, here's our new catalog and here are the ones you should look at. Uh, we just hired uh, Kara, who just started on the team just a few weeks ago. And her full-time job is now to find and solicit great titles in different themes, different categories, different features, and creating these. Uh, right now, there are online forms that we would send out to authors and say, hey, right now, for example, Apple's looking for Book's coming out in June and July. It's called a hot new summer promo. She's soliciting that. She's compiling them, putting them into a spreadsheet. She's going to present that to Apple. Now, again, we may present 50, 60, 70 titles. They may pick five. But yeah. that's what they do. That's what they do with traditional publishers. A traditional publisher will throw 30, uh, 300 uh, titles in a catalog, and they'll pick 10. So that's usually how uh, how that works. So there's a little bit more of that active promotion. Actually, tomorrow, Kara and I are meeting to go over the OverDrive promotions because there's some upcoming promotions we'll be doing to get stuff in OverDrive. Right now, we, uh, we have uh, a huge promo going on with the cost per checkout to OverDrive. And that is... Um, that's a huge sale in support of the libraries. We have, I think it's like 18,000 authors participating with all mm -hmm. of their titles available. And what I can tell you what we have seen has been unprecedented growth through the library channels since the middle of March, like the last two weeks of March, because I, I mean, my libraries here are shut down physically, but I can open up my, uh, my phone, I can open up the Libby app and I can get library books from my local library or Kobo has, uh, connections uh, to uh, OverDrive libraries as well on the newer readers. Um, that's a, a it, that's an amazing opportunity that we have not even begun to tap into as indie authors. So for people who are new, what is OverDrive? Oh, sorry, OverDrive mm -hmm. is uh, probably it was the first uh, significant library retailer. They're based out of Cleveland, Ohio, and they are uh, one of the most one of the largest retail uh, wholesalers for digital assets. Uh, they provide the libraries, uh, sig they're significant in North America. They do have reach in other countries around the world. But most of the libraries uh, here, like Toronto Public Library, Hamilton, Waterloo, Kitchener, major library systems are powered by OverDrive. So OverDrive.com is the company. And you can't, well, you can't really get into OverDrive directly. Uh, mm -hmm. You can, but you don't want to because they have a, a press play on tape one kind of technology system, like a courier pigeon, you know, you put, you tie, you tie a little note and mail it and the pigeon. The and Pony help. Express. <laughs> yeah, so uh, working with an aggregator to get into overdrive makes a lot more sense. Um, and uh, they're, they're great because they have two models, uh, if I can get another library model. And one is the one copy, one user, meaning they buy a, an ebook. And they, uh, you get, uh, so for example, if you were to go directly through Kobo, you get 50%. If you go through Draft mm -hmm. Digital, you get 47%. Uh, and that's just because Kobo and, and uh, Rakuten owns Kobo and Overdrive. So they're sister companies. They get a preferred rate. Um, so it's a 3% difference. That one copy per user. So let's say a $10 ebook, you're getting, you know, four, $4.70 or $5 for it. The library can then loan that to one patron at a time. If they have people on a waiting list, they have to wait till that uh, person's done with it. Then the, the DRM, you know, removes it from their their account back in, and then the next person can get it. But the cost per checkout or cost per circulation, depending on who in the industry you talk to, that model is you get one tenth, so you get fifty cents or forty seven cents for that. But instead of it being curated, where the library has to buy it up front and put it on the shelf. They put more titles up in a cost per checkout because they don't have to pay for them until someone checks it out. 
but you get that, let's say 50 cents or 47 cents every time someone checks it out. After mm -hmm. 10 people have checked it out, you've made the same amount of money. So um, the benefit in, in a case like that is if a local uh, book club wants to all read your book at once, the library would either have to buy a bunch of them or with cost per checkout, 30 people can check it out at once. And I only learned about how effective cost per checkout was is through Findaway Voices because the audiobooks go into uh, the libraries that way. And I was making most of my books off of my audiobooks. I was like, Bibliotheca, I've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, who is this other company? And Bibliotheca is another place that draft to digital submits to. I'm making all this money off these companies I've never heard of. I thought my money would be coming from, you know, Audible and Kobo and Nook and places like that. Um, and, and I was making more money off of the cost per checkout model. So, uh, and again, not a lot of systems have that. Uh, draft to digital has that to overdrive. Uh, Kobo doesn't actually have that right now. And, uh, and cost per checkout, let me see, cost per checkout is available through overdrive through um, Hoopla, uh, which is which is taking forever to load because they're really, really slow. They make overdrive look like, uh, you know, uh, Betamax compared to uh, Blu-ray uh, in terms of their speed of processing. And uh, a new one that's coming up, um, yeah, a new library retailer that will be rolling out very soon has both models as well. And there'll be like at least two more library uh, distributors will be adding uh, in the next probably three to six months. Wow, exciting. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting way to get into a completely different market. And yeah. you are on, on Amazon or on Kobo or whatever, the library market, it's, it's new, different readers. Well, yeah, yeah. You, I think you pointed out right there, it's different readers, right? A different yeah. people that are voracious, but not in a, in a, you know, like I said, a platform way, right? They want it. They go to the library. Their life, you know, yeah. Have to consume in that fashion, yeah. And mm -hmm. and and print purists are are learning hard and fast that ebooks are a really great solution because um, they don't bring home uh, viruses. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. That's a, I think it's a good segue actually to what yeah. you see changing in the industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have a spotlight reading from TV. Ooh. All right. This week's spotlight is on, you guessed it, No Safe Words, LLC. You've written your manuscript, but is it ready for readers? With over 6 million ebooks on Amazon, how do you make yours stand out from the pack? You start with a great editor. Enter No Safe Words. Professionals with experience in traditional and indie publishing, we offer the services you need from plot consultants to manuscript editing and blurb writing, we're here for your book. Our team has the experience, dedication, and imagination it takes to get you from idea to book launch. If you need any help with your book, check out their full suite of author services at nosafewords.com. Of doom. doom. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, that was the question of um, with the current state of the world, I think we're seeing a massive impact to not only the indie publishing, but probably more so to the traditional publishing. So that leads into the question of where do you see, will this transformation continue forward and what do you see? in the industry in the next, you know, year yeah. to two years? Uh, that That's a great question. Uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time and have spent a lot of time thinking about this. I remember, uh, I have to go back on this one. I remember the digital tipping point. It was a lot of people called it the Kindle gold rush or whatever it was 2009 through 2011, where the ebook finally, you know, a lot of things happened simultaneously. The Kindle was released. The iPad came out. Mm -hmm. You gotta remember that was like 2000, seven eight nine that, that that sort of era so it was very very new and by the time the ebooks took off in a dramatic way 600 percent year over year growth the ebook was 40 years old so remember that patience principle mm -hmm. i was i was a bookseller in 1999 when stephen king wanted to release an ebook yeah. <laughs> and and i was so excited it's like yes i'm ready for this and of course the world wasn't ready for ebooks back then not, not even the best-selling author in the world at the time could could sell an ebook. J.K. Rowling did not even put ebooks out when in the height of the Harry Potter phase, which mm -hmm. drove me nuts because I didn't want to get on a plane with 
the 600 page hardcover. I just wanted to read something. To I read actually did that back. once. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a digital tipping point, but eBooks, you have to remember, if you ask the average person who's not an author, um, well, A, what, if there were four of us and we were four regular people, not creative author, really awesome people, if we were just mm -hmm. regular people, um, only one of the four of us would have read a book since high school. That's pretty typical in, in, in America. And then of the one person who read that, one in, uh, one in, uh, or let's say two to three in 10 will have actually read an ebook because most of them are still reading print. And I know indie authors are all that they know and understand and love and, and make scoodles of money off of his ebooks. But the average person has never read an ebook. So we did have a digital tipping point where 20 to 30% of readers have migrated to ebooks. The good news is for print publishers is um, ebook readers uh, buy two to three times as many print books as they used to because they're reading more because now they have access to more books all the time. And then that's still 60 to 70% of the market. And this is generic. This is in certain genres, it's higher. It's higher in romance, for example, because it's quicker and faster and cheaper because romance readers maybe read two or three novels a day and it's way cheaper and faster to just get them to your Kindle or Kobo or Nook or whatever. Um, but then you've got um, a certain point now where it's harder to get print books. It's physically harder to, to get that. So suddenly the market is changing and there's going to be in the last month more people will discover the magic and joy because it's it's like a life-altering sensation when you do a digital-only diet and you go, oh my God, every book is large print. Oh, I can change the font if I don't like it. Oh, cool. I and it, and if you have a really good e-reading device, you can change it. Like if you have an iPad or an iPhone or whatever, you can change the reading the light so it's a you know not the white on black. It can be black on white. You can change those things. Come on, the page curl feature alone on my iPhone is phenomenal. <laughs> um, but I, I use a Kobo Reader. I, I have a lot of them because I worked there uh, over the years. And it and it's not a computer screen. It's it's not um, backlit blue light. It even has the light that does not stimulate your brain to keep you awake. So it's it's actually better than reading paper because I don't need to have a lamp on when my fiance is trying to get to sleep beside me I can I can turn the light down on my on the Kobo and it's not backlit so it's very comfortable and pleasing to the eyes so I can relax read for 10 15 minutes then go to sleep so I think there's going to be a huge growth and we have seen a huge growth in in just and I haven't seen the April sales yet because they're not finished coming in but the last two weeks of March we saw a 130 percent increase and the last time I remember seeing ebook sale increases like that was 2012 through 2014, or to 2015, 2016. I mean, th that was unprecedented growth back then. But now, now we're going to see more because when the world goes back to a somewhat of a normal state where we're, we're leaving our homes again and we're actually able to get out, I think there's a lot more people are going to be, uh, are, are still going to know that they can easily get access to digital reading. And if they've become a digital reader, well, they're probably gonna still buy more print books, but they're probably gonna read way more because they have more access to books. So I'm really, really hopeful about that. Um, I, I, I have a very positive, I'm, I'm kind of an optimistic uh, kind of guy, but I, I'll, I'll flip it. And, and I know I'm pre-answering another mm -hmm. question. We're going to see unprecedented growth, but we're also gonna see unprecedented um, commitment from the large publishers who until now their business has been shipping dead trees around warehousing right. shipping and putting them in, in in bookstores and then having them returned and that their whole business model and the majority of the money that they've made off of books has been print and their entire pricing structure for ebooks has been mm -hmm. to try to drive people back to the print book right. because they don't most of them don't really understand ebooks so indie authors had this amazing opportunity to see, oh, look, that book is 12 to $15. Well, I'm going to sell mine for five. Yeah. You know, they can buy three of my books for the price of one uh, traditionally published books. So uh, because the traditional publishers, uh, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't invest a lot of time and energy in figuring out how to sell it, they're, they're telling the market ebooks are dead. 
print is where it's at because they've invested and, and they're good at it because they've been doing it for decades and decades. This is what they do. Mm-hmm. Now they don't have Barnes and Noble opened across. Other, I mean, there, there's still shipping and stuff like that going on. There's online orders in my community. Uh, indie bookstores are amazing. They're, they're doing de- delivery and all kinds of uh, really great gymnastics to, to, to stay relevant and, uh, and be part of the community. But um now is the time when the publishers are finally going, hmm, well, all these books that we printed, <laughs> the 50,000 books, we're not going to sell as many because we can't pay for placement on, on, a, on an end cap at Barnes & Noble or whatever. So therefore, uh, e- they're, gonna, they're going to get savvy and smarter about ebooks. And so fortunately, indie authors already have a stakehold in there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and again, the reader doesn't care where the book came from. All they care is it's a good book that they want to read. So I think what we're going to see is we're going to see more competition, but at the same time, we're also going to have more readers. So it may not be as scary. If we had the competition without the extra readers, it would be a terrifying thing. But now I'm seeing we're getting more readers and we're getting more competition. So it's going to look the same. But mm-hmm. I still think the opportunity to reach new people who, you know, you had a book bub last year. And there weren't as many people signing up to to be new readers, but now new e-reader discoverers are going to go. Oh my God! There's a great place where you can find out about yeah. discounted books. Because <laughs> yeah. there's always going to be, you know, new readers. I mean, that's one thing that people need to get in their head like really fast. There are yeah. so many potential readers out there, and so many different ways to reach them. You know, there are plenty of readers for all of us because they could devour one of my books in a day. And I'm going to be like, you know, go check out Lauren. Go check out Mark, you know, read their stuff. And I'll have one out in another three months. Like it's there's plenty to go around. (laughs) That's exactly it. I couldn't have said that any better. That is exactly what it is. Now, are these new readers per se or are they readers that are already out there just reading more? Well, people who've never read an ebook, right? So they're yeah. readers, but they've always been readers, but now they're readers of ebooks, right? Mm-hmm. So they were never looking at your ebook before. Now they are. Uh, and and there's going to, well, I mean, there's always new readers coming into the marketplace, but now there's going to be a bigger funnel moving into the ebook space because they don't have any choice. And, and, in, and in many communities, the library sales, again, the library sales have just shot up and we haven't even seen them all come in. Uh, I can't wait to see what a full month of library sales is going to be, but I'm so excited to, to, you know, when those sales reports start going out to the authors. Uh, I mean, they can always log in and, and hit refresh and, and see their dashboard. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, they, they're back home writing because they should be writing, not looking at the dashboard right. every day. So. so those ebook readers, the new ebook readers, are mostly coming from people who are in the print sale market. Now they're turning to ebook market. It's not like they're normally Netflix watchers or video game players like in another entertainment. But but draft to digital thinks that they were print sales customers and they're now doing ebooks. How can draft to digital tell or can can we tell? <laughs> and I should say this is not draft to digital's prediction. Okay. This is Mark just kind of you know <laughs> calling. No, this is just my understanding of the industry and understanding readers. Mm-hmm. I do know, so I'm still I, I'm very active in, in 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 both sides of the industry and paying attention to stats. I actually look at indie stats and I look at traditionally published stats, and I and I try to place the little connections together. I do uh, pay attention to reports from BookNet Canada. And yeah, Canada is a much smaller country than the U.S., but we're very similar. Mm. Uh, you know, we we speak a similar English uh, for the most part. You know, we have a queen. <laughs> <laughs> Queens, that, Queens, but, Eng- Queens English, <laughs> but. Uh, the markets are similar. And so when I do look at a lot of market studies coming out of BookNet Canada, and I, what I'm, I'm drawing conclusions based on stuff that I'm seeing there, just saying, okay, it's very similar in the U.S. market. So I'm just looking at the reality of the situation is the libraries are making a significant pivot from print. They're not buying print books right now. They're buying ebooks right now. Patrons can't get print books from their libraries. They can get ebooks from their libraries very easily because most people have a tablet or a smartphone or some sort of computer where they can just read, uh, read those. So there's all of this discoverability. So we're kind of at the second wave of mm-hmm. think of this the second wave of the ebook rush. I'm not I'm not going to call it the Kindle Gold Rush. I'm going to call it the ebook rush because I think I think we're in a we're in a world where wide is recognized. And if you want to sell outside the U.S., you really need to look at markets like Apple and uh, and Kobo. 
and and Google as well, right? They're not we're not available through Draft to Digital, but you know, you can get onto Google now yourself directly. It's easy. Yeah, I have to say I'm one of those people that is hardcore print reader. And when I first started publishing back in 2014 or so, I only had my book in print because I didn't understand the whole ebook. It took me three years before I was like, you know, what is with this ebook thing? Yeah. And I figured it out. I listed it as ebook. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's a serious game changer. I got over myself because there's plenty of other people who are like ebooks. And, you know, now, you know, I'm becoming a bit more of an ebook reader because whereas before I could maybe buy one book a month, maybe, you know, I can get like, five if I want yeah you know, because they're not as expensive <laughs> and then if I really super love it I can get in print and have it forever so yeah and and then the libraries are going to have more too so you can even read more uh, through the library and and again the author is eventually getting uh, money from that um, that is great Point, uh, down in Australia currently with the COVID-19 event a majority of the municipal and state libraries have forged ahead with ebook lending yeah exactly and uh, yeah, and and again, when you're when you're in through the library markets, um, uh, Draft to Digital goes to Overdrive, Baker and Taylor, Biblioteca, Hoopla, and uh, more to come <laughs> that I, I can't say anything about yet, but more to come. Uh, so that's really, really exciting. Can I address a point? Uh, Dale asked a really good question, which I think raises something. Hey, Dale, how's it going, dude? Uh, is D to D a viable option for small indie presses? Asking for a friend. Um, yeah, and here's what I'm going to tell you, because one of the next great developments that D2D is working on right now is payment splitting. So there was Kindle Worlds where you could write in other people's universes and stuff like that, and they shut that down. Draft to Digital launched, uh, and it's still in beta release right now, D2D universes. And a lot of authors who are doing Kindle Worlds have moved into D2D universes. It's the same idea. You have a universe, you let someone write in it, you get a cut of their, their proceeds. The cool thing about it is now you can be in that and, and publish wide. And there are a bunch of authors doing really well with D2D universes. Well, the technology that we built for D2D universes allows payment splitting. And the, the other thing that I believe about the publishing industry is it's continuing to get more collaborative than ever before. We're now even way more collaborative now that we're Zooming and doing all these videos and and, and all of this from, from remote locations. And so, what we are uh, building is the ability for so a small publisher, instead of having to take the money and then figure out, okay, I'm in Canada and now I have to pay a bunch of Americans. I got to pay someone in Australia. I got to pay someone in the UK. I got to pay someone in Germany. Oh my God, the taxes. How do I deal with this? I have to claim it. Then I have to claim the, this is ridiculous. Draft to digital will take care of that for you where you just say, okay, I've got this book published. Like for example, I've done anthologies in the past. And normally an anthology, I'd do a flat fee. I'd pay everyone up front and then I just publish it. And then I, I just keep all the money because it's just easier than me having to go, okay, we got, you know, 50 cents from, you know, Amazon in India. And we got uh, like all of these different pay. I got to split 50 cents 12 ways. Uh, so that's the kind of thing. With D2D, you, you would be able to come in and this is what we're building and say, okay, I'm the publisher. So as the publisher, I get X percent and every single contributor gets whatever. Or it's a digital bundle where we're all, doing like first book and series and we've bundled it. Okay, I'll manage it and we're all gonna split it even. And when the money comes in, it can all go out. And for a small publisher who may be uh, using advances, and this is uh, specifically a project I inherited that I'm gonna be publishing later this year, I wanna pay the authors a small advance up front. And then after I out earn the advance earns itself back, so I've actually earned the money I've invested into it, then everyone gets a cut. Because right now with the initial anthology I published uh, in 2008, I paid everyone up front. I've earned back the advance, but the way I'd set it up, like they have the rights back to the stories, but I have non-exclusive rights. Now I'm making money off the book, but none of the contributors are. It was just too difficult because of the, but if I if I were to use draft to digital, that's both for both print and for, for ebook, I don't have to do anything other than it's published. D to D is going to pay them. Okay. <laughs> I, I get actually, cut, they get their cut. Every they get tax forms from D to D. I don't have to deal with it. So uh, really beneficial for small presses and collaborative authors. So you you actually touched on a good point. It's one of the last questions we have on here, but I keep hearing it a lot because uh, yes. Draft to Digital was definitely first the ebook yes. um, distributor. 
Everyone really wants to know what's happening with prints yes. for D2. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I alluded to earlier, we launched draft to digital print in beta with, with a partner. So IPG, Independent Publisher Group, they actually have warehouses and they represent thousands of uh, smaller press uh, publishers, US, and most of them are, are US. And they have warehousing, but they also have print on demand facilities. And they're also probably uh, Ingram, one of Ingram's largest partners. And so when you publish through D2D print, we're sending that to IPG. IPG is handling that. And then they're using the distribution network, the same distribution network you get from Ingram. So the way I like to say D2D print is like Ingram Spark is the Cadillac that gives you all the choices, all the bells and whistles, all the options, all the radio stations and the satellite radio and all the really funky things. And, and draft to digital print, D2D print, is like a Ford Focus. It's a very good, reliable car. It doesn't have any flash and bells and whistles. The difference is draft to digital print is 100% free. You get a free ISBN if you want. Ingram Spark does cost money, and right? It's setting the titles up and stuff, and you have to get an, you have to pay for your own ISBN or bring your own. Draft to digital print uh, with Ingram Spark, you'll get 40 different options for trim sizes. At D2D print, it's about 16. Uh, at Ingram Spark, you can do hardcover and color interiors and stuff. D2D, it's black and white, it's trade paperback. But it's a really viable option. And uh, we rolled out on the 24th of March. We finally rolled out the changes based on months of great feedback from our beta users. And every week since then, we've been rolling 100 or so more people every week into the beta program. If you're on the waiting list, and the way you can get there is drafttodigital.com slash I think it's something easy like print or print waiting list or whatever. You can email support at draftdigital.com and say, hey, how do we get on the waiting list? Uh, sign up because every week we're rolling in. And, and we're only rolling in 100 people at a time only because we don't want to overwhelm our amazing customer service people because we do actually talk to you on the phone and we'll walk through things with you. And so if we suddenly get 5,000 people all rushing <laughs> in, we're not going to be able to help them. So, so if you're on the waiting list, um, just bear with us. Every week we're, we're rolling new people in. And so it's it's eventually just over the course of the next month or two, I bet you everyone who's on the waiting list is going to finally have it, if that helps. No, that does. That's awesome. Um, because not only can you get to so many different retailers via ebook, you can get one of the top leading print on demand, not going to cost you a thing. And it's all through the same place. Yeah, not only that, but they'll make they'll make a, a cover for you. This is so cool. I got to show you this. I only designed the front cover. This is mm -hmm. a, a digital chat book. It's only about 10,000 words. Snowman Shivers. It's a free ebook. Draft to digital, the built-in bit print beta will automatically do the cover wrap for you. So I only had to have the front cover and it automatically does the back oh, and the wrap God. and the spine. Yeah. So for all yeah. the books where I've only invested in front cover, D2D makes it free. I don't have to go and pay a designer to go and design uh, a cover for me. Oh, I yeah. have, to have it done. So uh, it's one of the, again, free tool that you can use when you're when you're doing your print books through draft to digital. So uh, Sam point had a follow-on question. Um, so the current problem with the Chinese presses where a lot of the presses aren't available anymore to the overseas market, like the, the publishers cannot get to their books that are in China getting printed at the presses there. Um, via PM won't affect the smaller presses. PM, what's PM? Mm -hmm. Oh, via, via private message. Uh, I think Lauren. He, yeah, you private message oh. you. <laughs> yeah, he did an article. Um, okay, so this problem won't affect smaller presses? Oh, that's a question, I think. Yeah, that, that are publishing draft digital? I don't know. I can't really answer what's going on with people printing stuff in China. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> Sorry, Sam, I, I don't understand. Uh, so we can you can still upload your book to Amazon, for example, and get it printed through Amazon's presses. Is that... Same is true with um, draft digital. Yes, you can. <laughs> I, I think not... nothing's caught fire. It's, it's what, what sorry. It like. Ooh, all right. Sorry, I speak um, Canadian. I don't understand what you guys are asking. <laughs> right. I have another I question. You're talking a boot, and I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, <didn't hear> that. <laughs> um, I had another question. So, draft digital sent out an email about. Um, Money coming in, I think from Barnes and Nobles, yeah. 
and that would be delayed because of the yeah so they they had indicated that they were not going to be able to pay all of the money uh they were asking um they were going to pay one third of it and we looked at it and said we can't do this to our authors it, even though it's in the we have every right in the contract that we only give you the money when we get it we said let's have faith that D, that the Barnes and Noble will come through, and we 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 were going to just pay you anyway. But we wanted to let you know about that because, uh, but then we found out that it was a miscommunication error, and that they had assumed we were like like the Random Houses and the Harper Collins and all the major publishers because we're such a big an account that they because again you got to remember these publishers they don't pay their authors every month. They can get the money and sit on it. And then, I mean, I get paid for my traditional publishers usually once a year. Some publishers will pay twice a year. So with us, we pay, we get the money, we pay the authors right away. So the big publishers can probably bear it for a little longer. Uh, and they put us in that class because we were so big. And so that's, we were like, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna help our authors? And then fortunately the author community and, and to be quite honest, the good people at Barnes and Noble when they when they realized what was happening, they they came back and said, "No, we're paying you." And and so there might have been a delay of a of, of a few days uh, in in the process, but I believe the processing is going on just as normal now. So, and 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 I have to say, the author community was just so wonderful about that. Uh, and even even the folks at Barnes and Noble, like they're they care. Uh, it was it was good to see that. You know, and that's a lot where patience. And professionalism definitely comes into the indie publishing world. You know, it, everything happens so fast. Sometimes you have to take a breath. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to be like, okay, so not actually giant publisher. We've got about 10,000 people waiting for their money. Um, this is what we do. Yeah. It's, you know, you've got to keep that line of communication open, you know, yeah. take off the caps lock find some happy words <laughs> oh yes <laughs> oh, exactly yeah yeah All i right, love so that this has been an amazing conversation i mean we probably have questions that we didn't even get to i'm sorry uh, <laughs> long-winded yeah it's but i mean it's all good information Draft digital has so much going on i mean i knew that it had all these you know things that you could like the apples and the bnns and all the things that you can do you can get your free um epub or um what's the other one universal anyway, so there's like three you can get a pdf of oh, your yeah. ebook yeah. epub you can get the moby that's the one i was looking for yeah the moby and you don't even have to you know publish on uh draft digital you can take that and go put it on amazon if you want um, yep. I didn't realize how many free opportunities there are for authors to reach more readers, uh, to get their name out there more. If you're willing to put in the work, put in the legwork, do your research. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming on. How can our yeah. you know viewers, fans, stalkers stalk you nicely, not creepily? <laughs> I mean, drafttodigital.com. You can link to our blog from there. We've been doing these great D to D live video chats using the same cool tool you're using to publish these. Um, as well as uh, I'm, I'm at Mark Leslie on Twitter, and you can if you Google me, I'm I'm all over the place. So, all right, so you can Thanks find Mark everywhere. And That's thank fine. you so much, Ken. For, no, you're down here. <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> no, everything went oh, back with Ken's there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank yeah, you. for more, more, and also Ken down here and somewhere, and Mark because he's awesome as well. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to hit the subscribe button, ding the bell. We're last I checked at 902 subscribers on YouTube. We are so close to that 1,000 mark. You have no idea how badly we want to get there that this year. And I really think we could do that. I think we can do it. You know, before well, the okay. end of the I, if I haven't subscribed, I'm gonna sub subscribe as soon as we get off this call. And I think everyone Yay! watching can yeah. probably hit that button. See if you can beat me to the button. <laughs> all right, everybody has to beat Mark to the subscribe button. Um, all right, so yeah, make sure to check us out. Um, Monday we have live with Josh and Scott. Um, if you are um, a really early morning person, we've got coffee and concepts with Walt Robillard. <laughs> Ro Robillard, oh, there, got it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we're here every Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, live is also 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern on Mondays. And yeah, be sure to check us next time. Check us out next time where we're going to talk about more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. <laughs>